Very good. Welcome back. So we have a couple of meetings left uh, today uh, and Thursday before I will be away. Next week, I'm traveling. So you will be uh, fortunate to have two lectures on social network analysis by Patrick Park on Tuesday and Thursday next week uh, while I'm away. Um, and then I'll see you the week after that. I would like us to finish some of this regression stuff that we've been talking about over the past week and a half or whatever. Um, so I'll try to do that today and on Thursday to leave you in a good place before I travel. Okay. So let me just start from the obvious. Uh, has anybody tried to finish this? And have you run into any interesting, do you have any interesting observations to share with the class from your attempts at uh, modeling this data uh, that we looked at together uh, last week? Has anybody tried to finish this after class and has any interesting observations or thoughts? Sounds like we need a homework on regression. I got to the end, but I'm pretty sure it's not right. We can, what, do you have concrete things? We can talk about it for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, ask, ask us, okay. what, what uh, doubts do you have? Ask us. Um, see, this is why I should have kept quiet. <laughs> um, <laughs> I feel the silence, yeah. Um, you know, my, my residuals uh, don't look right. Um, Story of my life. Yeah, yeah. Welcome to my world. <laughs> That's your concern? Um, it is a valid one. That's one of my concerns, yeah. Yep. Okay, well, so maybe, uh, maybe we do this after class. I'm happy to stick around for a bit and we can look at it together. Because I don't know how long this will take. It could be a you know rabbit hole. Okay. We could be here all night. Sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> any any other observations or high level thoughts that don't require us debugging residuals right now? Any modeling thoughts? There were some interesting modeling alternatives here. I was hoping you would have some thoughts about this. Um, and Bobo, for context, you weren't here. We were talking about how. I bet they're all going to use fixed effects and I'll be really happy with them for family. They may try to do this, uh, this last bit, these last two bullets here. They may try this. It's quite interesting. There are things that I'm still confused about myself when it comes to these. I was hoping you would get to experience the same hurdles that. I've been tormenting me for the past week. It's okay if you haven't, you haven't. We can talk about it some other time. Okay, I take that as a no. Good. So um, let's do um, let's do the other paper that we uh, said we would read about regression modeling. Uh, Elijah was kind enough to volunteer to present that, uh, and then we're going to talk about time series analysis uh, after that, and some other stuff. So I will shut up, I think, from my end, if I can do that and stop sharing. Testing. Trying again. There we go. Let me share my screen. And then, well, actually, will that show up there? Um, yes, I will put you up there. Okay.
Okay, so the paper I read was about uh, how and why do college students uh, use Wikipedia. It, I mean, exactly like the title sounds, um, it's motivated by the fact that a lot of people use uh, Wikipedia, but prior to this study, there wasn't a lot of empirical research about how college students in particular use Wikipedia and sort of how they parse their information. Um, and this has implications just for instructors in understanding how their students may be using sources, but also for people like librarians who may be teaching uh, source methods and things like that about how they should talk about and approach Wikipedia. So um, the research questions inspired from that were how do college students use Wikipedia? How do college students perceive the information quality on Wikipedia? excuse me, on Wikipedia, to what extent are college students confident in evaluating information quality of Wikipedia, and why do college students use Wikipedia? Um, as a theoretical framework, I'm not sure why that's not showing, there we go. As a theoretical framework, they used uh, something called social cognitive theory, which the authors described as um, viewing self-efficacy as a central concept explaining human Sorry, Zoom is blocking my view. Um, explaining human motivation um, and achievement. So they considered four sources of self-efficacy, uh, mastery experience, vicarious experience, verbal persuasion from others, and uh, physiological and psychological or and effective states. So um, when they say mastery experience, they mean like their personal experience using Wikipedia. Vicarious experience means more so like, what do they hear from other people about Wikipedia? Verbal persuasion is like, um, you know, do other people say you should use Wikipedia? Um, and physiological and affect states are like, how do they emotionally feel towards uh, Wikipedia? What is their... Uh, I guess, disposition towards Wikipedia in general. So the authors also added additional uh, two additional model variables based on prior literature in the context of the internet. So they looked at how, the trust that people have in the information and also uh, users' perception of the utility of the information. So yeah, this is the model that they use um, where you have sort of past experience, vicarious experience, verbal persuasion, emotional states, disposition information, and information utility all feeding into both, you know, their actual use and also their outcome expectations. And outcome expectations is treated as a mediator for you uh, between these and use. So to evaluate this, um, they evaluated seven hypotheses. It was really more like 13 hypotheses because these were like, two hypotheses each, these six years. So they looked at how, whether positive past experience with Wikipedia, positive vicarious experience, verbal persuasion, positive emotions, and one's tendency to believe information, unfamiliar information, were associated with both um, outcome expectations. So how do they expect uh, Wikipedia to work well for them? and then their actual use frequency. Um, these construct, to measure, to evaluate these hypotheses, they conducted a survey with students for extra credit in an in introductory journalism course. So these were primarily first, second year students, although there were some older students as well. They used uh, Likert scale items to measure the uh, constructs from one to seven. Um, with appropriate options, depending on what question they were asking. They also had demographic questions, including their academic status and major, like I mentioned. Um, and this sort of brings up, I think, one of the threats to validity of this study, which is these measures are sort of very, they're based on these sets of Likert scale questions, which have high correlation with one another. And it's based on prior literature, but um, how well those constructs actually match to the um, intended variable, I think, is a little questionable. Uh, like some of the questions they're asking, like frequency of use, they're asking, like, how often did you use Wikipedia in the past semester? And that seems to me like very hard to like mentally say, 
oh, well, I used it more than 15 times, or I used it between six and 15 times or something, like, which were sort of the options they had. So there may be a little bit of confounding there. Um, so they to evaluate this, they used four linear sets of linear models. So the first model looked at factors with regards to the outcome expectations. So all the independent variables and then the mediator on the other side. And then they looked at factors impacting use without looking at the, the mediator. Then they looked at the mediator, outcome expectation, and use. And then finally, they looked at all the independent variables together and how that affected use. Um, yeah, and regressions one, three, and four allow the authors to determine whether uh, outcome expectation is a mediator by looking at whether one, is there a correlation between the other independent variables and outcome expectation, but also does outcome expectation affect um, affect use by itself? So, a hundred. The, uh, the, the background they had with the, the model. Let's show again. Yeah, this. So, all of these independent correlated with outcome expectations and with use, but also mm -hmm. outcome expectations correlated with use. Yeah, that's that. That was the model. And not the other way around. If use does not predict outcome. No, they didn't look at that. And tell us again how the regressions test this. So it's a simple linear, there's simple linear regressions and basically determining whether there is a relationship between the constructs of these different variables and either the outcome expectations or use depending on the model. So the first one is all the independence with the top thing on the right. Like outcome expectations. Yeah. So, oh, I just flipped to that. Don't do that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. The second one, wait, no, one, three, and four. One, three, three is outcome expectation on you. So that's the down arrow on the right. Yes. Yeah. That's so the first regression is all of the independence to outcome expectations. Yeah. Then um, the second one is, I think, just the arrows between these variables and use. Gotcha. And then the third is just this and to this. And then the last one considers the entire model, basically. Gotcha. 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 Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, and so the results, 100% of the students they surveyed used Wikipedia. Uh, only 33% reported that they used it for academic purposes. Um, kind of a contradiction, not really, I don't think, but um, the participants held a moderate perception of, of the information quality on Wikipedia, but they also reported having like a positive experience with using information from Wikipedia, so a higher Likert scale value. Um, their, the results from the models are here. It's kind of a lot to read out, but um, they found correlations like between outcome expectation and the other, and most of the other independent variables. Um, but, uh, and then also they found correlation between, or an uh, association between emotional state and information utility when they only considered the in, the non-mediator variables, this gets confusing to talk about because there's a lot of models, but when they considered outcome expectation by itself, it was highly associated with the um, Wikipedia use, but when they considered all the variables, uh, that association didn't hold, and the only variable that had a um, association or that they were able to confirm had an association was the uh, perception of information utility. So this fails to support uh, outcome expectation as a mediator. And the authors also said that it calls into question whether SCT is valuable for looking at um, this research question. Um, because only like one of the variables from SCT was even really correlated with the Wikipedia use. And then once you included all the variables, that association went away. So only emotional, um, which, what is it called? 
only their emotional perspective towards Wikipedia, which is one of the variables from SCT was associated with use. Um, but that association disappears when you consider all the variables. So, um, and I think that's all I have. Yeah. They have enough power for all of this? Was it, was it 150 servers left? Yeah, 137, I think. So yeah. Sounds like know. a lot of regressions to run. I, they didn't correct the values or anything like that. Because uh, I guess it was planned comparisons. I, I don't, I didn't really see the, the value in all the regressions they ran, to be honest. Um, but I don't know, like particularly the one between the the sort of I guess every model except the fourth model or I don't know I, I didn't see the full use of all the models I guess but uh, yeah do you remember this discussion we had a little while ago about you know the risk with running so many tests what was it Torture the data long enough, we'll confess. Torture the data long enough, we'll confess. Yeah, it's a nice way of putting it. So like something will turn out significant, right? The more of these you run just by chance, you'll end up with some. So that's a risk. Right? Did they do anything to address this? Not that I remember being in the paper. <laughs> uh, I read it this morning, so. Any other thoughts on the uh, on the analysis or the regressions? You like? I don't understand how their independent variables could possibly be independent. Like, I feel like you ask someone, do you think you, Wikipedia has information utility, yes or no? Do you expect using Wikipedia will give you information? Like it's the same question uh -huh. asked in a different way. Well, to clarify, they used sets of sets of Likert skill questions. So it was more than just a single, they were taking like six questions and basically uh, using that as the, the factor there. Like they're, and they had the items they used had high correlations with one another. Um, but yes, I agree. Theoretically, I didn't necessarily agree with like the way they were looking at it. Um, but this is a good point about skills. Let's talk about this for a second. I think you bring up a really good point. Uh, I'm going to switch the audio to this side again. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, let me, sorry, give me a second. Smartphone connected. I don't know why you say that. Hello. I take it you can still hear us on Zoom? We can hear you. Yes, thank you. Perfect. OK. So uh, I want to touch on this briefly because I think it's a really important point. And I don't know that we gave this enough time when we talked about survey design earlier. Um, when you design a survey questionnaire, you can ask a question, right? And you know, uh, have Likert scale answers to that question, right? You know, how, what was the one you gave as an example? Uh, the information um, utility and the expected outcome. How useful do you find information on Wikipedia or something like this? Right. Like, please rate how, yeah. right, okay. So you could do that uh, with one question and you would get you know, one value of this you know, uh, measurement, right, on, on that question. Or you could develop a scale. We didn't really talk about this. It was in the, in the reading, so I don't know that we talked about this much. Uh, you can develop a scale that consists of multiple questions phrased slightly differently that all ask about essentially the same concept or construct. Um, and the second one is a much stronger way of you know, designing a questionnaire because you know you sort of average out all of the noise, right? Uh, right you know, the, the misunderstandings and confusions and whatnot 
arising from you know people potentially misinterpreting one phrasing of the same question would go away, would drown out, would average out when you also ask them essentially the same question in, in multiple ways, right? So you will see that the better surveys often have this you know, scale uh, design to them rather than sort of individual single questions you know, asking about something. Uh, they will often ask you the same thing in multiple, slightly different ways uh, and you know, basically average out the responses across all of those. Right, so there's more work that goes into designing and validating the survey ahead of time. You have to, you know, you have to figure out and be confident that these slightly different questions actually capture the same construct. Right, you, you have to put more work into this ahead of time, but it gives you better data afterwards. So it sort of pays off. Uh, interesting trade-off. Yep. I think my comment is a little more along the lines of what Elijah was saying. That, that theoretically, I think I don't agree with. The, the concept that information utility is not correlated with expected outcome. Even if the survey is well designed, and so I think the, the, the actual concepts itself are not sufficiently different. Yep, that makes sense. You could take that up with him. Yeah, and they did pull the, they used Likert's, they used um, scales developed in private prior literature primarily and they reported the like showing that yes these do correlate well with one another so to confirm that regardless of what they are measuring they are measuring the same thing uh -huh. cool. and so I, I like this paper a lot because it had a very explicit causality model uh, you know motivating the study like it, it, they were very clear about what the causal presumed causal relationships were they made those explicit, they you know, made moderators explicit, and they designed the study to find evidence supporting those causal relationships very deliberately. It wasn't sort of, it read like not a fishing expedition to me because it sort of had this causality model built into the design of the study. So I like that about it a lot. Um, I think that's pretty rare, right? So that you see that laid out explicitly. It was a nice box and arrow diagram. Did we ever do this? We do? With boxes and arrows? Do we do causality models like this with boxes and arrows in our papers? I thought it was nice. I liked it. The information sciences papers have this a lot, I think. Yeah, also, last year was attending a uh, uh, like preschool seminar and a lot of their papers were in that style. Yeah. Okay, very good. All right, so uh, thanks a lot. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about time series. But before then, a quick thing just to make sure that uh, we all remember this important thing. What was one of the fundamental assumptions of these linear regression models that you know, makes them valid? or invalid when we violate it. What's one of the fundamental assumptions, one of the most basic ones of these linear regression models? It's normally distributed. Close, very close. Something, something is normally distributed. I was gonna say linearly, but you assume. Isn't that each of the factors are normally distributed? That is not a requirement. Uh, but you're close. What about them? Because that uh, indicates the model fails. Right, but so in independence of something, something with independence. I'm looking at looking for something with independence as a keyword. Courtney says residual is normally distributed. Uh, Courtney is probably right. He's nodding. No, I, I think, think we don't have this requirement because you guys said you can use EIF to say that some of the variables are correlated with others. 
which is five. But independence of what? There's, there's some independence. They ask for some independence. Uh, yes, so, okay, so the, you're right. The term is used in two uh, settings and it's confusing. We talk about dependent variables and independent variables. You know, the dependent is the thing on the left. The independent are all the things on the right. Um, true, but I'm looking for something else. Something with independent, Google. The thing is, I need independent. Right, why? why? The observations have to be independent. Why? Like, what's the symptom of that not being the case? I know there will be something wrong with the observation. Yes, and you see it in the residuals, right? So that's where the thing comes from. That's where we're looking at Krishna's cheating. Okay. So the reason we look at these plots of residuals and we look for absence of patterns there is because that indicates that the, the observations that went into the model in the first place, in the, in the data in the first place, were independent and that's something that's required. If they're not independent, that means their errors will be correlated and they will show up in you know, patterns in the residuals, okay? So this was one of the fundamental assumptions of all of these models to work. Everything we've talked about so far requires this fundamental assumption. And now I wanna talk about time series, which is you know, uh, observations of uh, some variable over time for the same individual you know, say I observe your, I don't know, grades over time throughout the program, or I don't know, I observe somebody's height over time as they grow or somebody's weight over time or whatever, uh, okay? So now by definition, by the its very nature, this kind of data breaks that fundamental assumption, doesn't it? These aren't, independent observations anymore. They all belong to you, right? You, we could have multiple individuals in our sample, but we have you know, multiple observations for the same individual, okay? And that's the problem because it breaks this fundamental assumption. And we talked about, we talked about this in this context a little bit. We talked about a couple of ways of dealing with this, you know, in this context. What were they? So here, you know, this data said this was the, the Galton height, children's height data. We had multiple kids from the same family. And then we had multiple families. Right? And there is some correlation, presumed correlation. It's possible that there's some correlation between kids of the same parents. Right? It's, it's more likely that their heights will be similar within the same family, right, than across random families. There's some correlation there, which kind of breaks this fundamental assumption. Okay, so we had to deal with that somehow, right? And there were two ways to deal with this that are, I mean, one of them is mentioned explicitly in the last bullet. The other one is mentioned there too. They're both mentioned, okay? What were they? <laughs> it's not a trick question. Your come on, come on, let's wake up. Your screen is not shared on Zoom. Oh, shoot. <laughs> oh, man, this is gonna kill me. Okay. I'm sorry about that. We're still talking about we're talking about this you know, trick that we did. We, we did something to, to make this work. Yes, Eli. We added to the linear model, like the, we kind of changed it to have the mean and the offset from the mean as part of the effect. Yeah, we did that too. We did do that. That was, it was slightly different. We did do that. Um, yes, that was slightly different, but we did do that. That was useful. That would not fix this problem of siblings. Can you add a factor for the family? That's one thing I could do. I could add a factor for every family 
because I know I, I have that recorded in the data. I could have a term and the model for every value of that family variable. So basically estimate a different intercept for every family. Okay. Or we talked about, we didn't really talk about, we, we, I showed you an example of how you could do this with mixed effects models instead. You could, you know, indicate this nesting structure in the data, you know, you have a height nested within family or something like this. Um, and, you know, I, I have this argument with Bobo all the time about how you should always use mixed effects. He's like, no, 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 you should always use mixed effects. Anyway, you know, you could do this in both ways. It's sort of besides the point I'm trying to make right now, but there, the, the point I'm trying to make right now is that this is a problem that you have to deal with. The fact that these things are not independent is something you have to deal with somehow. And I showed you maybe two ways to deal with this. So now coming back to uh, the other thing I want to show you, which, well, it's not like I can find my mouse or anything like that. Which is this. Okay, so now let's say let's say we have time series data. Okay, so we're switching from I don't know panel data, kind of uh, observations of different individuals that make up a sample, to time series data, observations of the same thing over time. And this kind of data fundamentally breaks that assumption. I think you will agree. Okay, so this is a completely different and interesting class of data that we have to deal with somehow. Um, so here's an example just to, to get you warmed up. Um, this is uh, this is beer production in Australia. This is a time series of quarterly. Uh, amounts of beer produced in Australia over time. Uh, so I don't know what the unit is on the y-axis, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and you have some uh, years on the x-axis. And I think there's four observations per year corresponding to the four quarters in a year. Um, so what do you see at this time series? What's the pattern? There's a peak. It's like seasonal. I'm guessing there's peaks and dips is a pattern. Yes. And you said seasonal. What does that mean? I would presume this is making assumptions about the domain, but maybe it might spike during the summer and then during the fall and the spring. Right. So if you look, you know, within each year, you probably see some sort of seasonal trend that, and you know, probably you're, I think you're right. It makes sense, right? There's more whatever drink, uh, any kind of drink that's up in, in the summer because it's hot, people are thirsty. They also probably drink more beer. So there's more produced, less so in the winter. That makes sense. Um, so that's one pattern. What's the other pattern you see? Overall increasing over time, right? So there's two kinds of things going on, right? Over time, there's increasingly more beer being produced. And within each year, it varies with the seasons. Okay. Is it, uh, you know, from one year to the next, is the range different over time or is it about the same? So, like, you know, how much they produce, uh, how much more they produce in the summer relative to the winter? Is that about the same or is that? Kind of also changing over time. It kind of looks like the peaks are peakier. <laughs> right, right, maybe a little bit, but it's a, I think I would call this more about the same than, you know, wildly different. Okay, All right. Here's another one. This one monthly airline passengers. Uh, do, do, do. Here we go. Monthly airline passengers. What's the pattern? Right. Okay. So we see 
more airline passengers over time in general, we see some kind of seasonal effects, right? It sort of you know goes up and down every year. Uh, is the range about the same, or is it widely different with time? Increasing. Seems like it's proportional to the global Aha. Uh -huh. uh, we're on to something. Cool. So these are two classes of time series. The first one is called additive. Because sort of the, the, the range stays the same, but you're kind of you know adding something every year. The second one is called multiplicative because the range is proportional to uh, the value it's at in that year, the value starts at in that year. All right. Um, so this is um, you know, if, if I were to extract each of these two trends that you've observed, right? in both cases, you've mentioned some kind of seasonal trend and you've mentioned some global trend. How might I do this? What's a way to estimate the, say the global trends in both of these cases? How might I do that? Simple linear regression of time. The general trend, I mean. Yep. How do I? That sounds right. How do I compute the general trend? Think of some moving average type thing. That's maybe the easiest way to do that. Um, so here is uh, here is an example of that. The first one. So this is a moving, sorry, a moving average of that uh, time series data. Order equals four means there's four uh, neighboring observations, consecutive observations being used to compute the moving average. And then you shift by one and you use the other, you know, the next four and so on. It always lags, you know, you look four, take the first four, compute the value of the moving average, you shift one, you know, take those four, compute the next value of moving average, and so on. Sam. This more than Yes, that happened to be four was chosen because that happened to be the way uh, the number of observations we had per year here. The beer data was quarterly, so four points a year. Um, and if you do that, you would get this, say, uh, you know, uh, trend line. You could also do, you know, one simple linear regression like Elijah was suggesting earlier. That works just as well. Could do that too. Uh, that will give you, you know, this is sort of an interrupted regression line, right? Sort of, yeah, broken up into many segments. You could just do one whole thing for the whole trend. Uh, that would also be fine. Um, the right, and this is a visualization of just the trend line. You could do the same thing. Here it is. This is the same thing for airline passengers. Uh, and this one's done over 12 using 12 consecutive observations because these were monthly uh, observations of uh, airline passengers. Um, and then that would give you something very similar. It would give you a trend line and, uh, and you can visualize that separately. Okay, very good. So now that's a trend. It is a trend. Okay. So I could take that out. Okay, I have the raw observations. And I could take out the trend values from that. Okay. So from the beer raw data, I take out the beer trend and I get whatever's left. Okay. I have. So now what you're left with is, you know, this a seasonal variation that you hypothesized and whatever else is error and noise is there, right? It's not gonna be perfect. But in any case, we've taken out the trend. You could do the same thing with the airline passengers. Note that instead of uh, subtracting them, I'm dividing them here because of the multiplicative nature of this 
uh, compared to the additive nature of the previous one. Okay. Uh, and then you would get something very similar. Sam again. When I'm looking at the division for the beer one, like, can, are you sure that that was not multiplicative? Because the, like, the range is a lot smaller. Like, it goes from 250 to 300 instead of like 100. Um, if you look at, yes, fair enough. I was, yes, okay, you could try that. Maybe I should choose a cleaner example of an additive time series. To illustrate the point, uh, you're saying this is narrower, you know, on the left but end I mean, than yeah, it's on the right end. It's the difference in from the left to right was like five to six. Yeah. So this looks also looks kind of like five to six to me. Yes, I uh, I accept that argument. This was meant to illustrate additive rather than multiplicative because I already have a better example for multiplicative, the airline passengers. Uh, but I can see your point uh, and I accept it. That you could, you know, you could hypothesize that this is also somewhat multiplicative. It's just probably a very small multiplier compared to the other one, but I agree. Um, okay, so now how might we figure out what the seasonal trend is for either one of these? I don't. I, I have no idea even what that means. I mean, I. I know what that means, but I, I don't know how you do that. That's beyond my pay scale. <laughs> Different department. I, I don't know how to do that, but I, I can't comment on the validity of that. I just don't know how to do that. Does anybody know? Uh, Fourier transform. Sorry. Oh, there, there is an R. Well, sure, but. I mean, I, I know how to do it, you know, I know how to implement it, but like how to find the library call. I just, I don't know why that's a good choice. I don't know. Well, are you looking like you're hypothesizing this is periodic, right? Yes. Some like combination of like tiny little functions. So the Fourier transform will tell you which ones they are. Cool. Okay, cool. I don't, I don't know how to do that, but I believe you. Um, this one is much. Less sophisticated. It's sort of an average across columns, if you will, as opposed to across rows. So, I, you know, I'm taking, uh, you know, the average of the, uh, you know, first quarters across all the years, and then the average of the second quarters across all the other years, and so on. Sorry, average of the first quarters across all years, average of the second quarters or second month across all years. Average or the third quarter or third month across all years and so on and so forth. I just do the average over columns as opposed to over, over rows. Um, and I I've done that and I get you know I get something very nice and clean that reflects some seasonal trend. Okay, um, and it's obviously it's obviously a clone of the individual you know level yearly pattern because it's all the same by definition that's how i compute it right it's every season it repeats every year right so uh, you know whatever the trend is within a year is just copied over across years okay uh, very good so i do that for beer i do that for uh, airline passengers uh, i get something so now uh, you could ask what's left. Okay, so I, I've taken out the global trend, and I've taken out the seasonal trend, and, uh, and what's left is just what's left. So, I, so I, you know, I take out the global trend, I take out the seasonal trend, and what's left is what's left, and hopefully it looks like random noise around zero. Okay, and you know, kind of, kind of, sort of does. Okay. This was beer. Uh, I could do the same for um, airline passengers, you know, except I'm dividing instead of subtracting for the argument before. Uh, and I get something very similar. So now it hovers around one instead of around zero, but hopefully you kind of see the same thing. There should be no clear patterns, ideally, right? You know, if, if the global trend is a good approximation of the real global trend and the seasonal trend is true, then whatever's left should be noise. Right, uh, so there you have it. So this was a trick. Now you could save yourself all of this trouble of doing all of this by hand 
if you uh yes yeah, so that's just i'm reconstructing the same thing back you get the point skipping 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 right you could save yourself the trouble of doing all of this by hand even though now you've learned how to do it by hand so you can if you want to show off to, uh, that you could do it by hand um you could just use this built-in uh where do we call this decompose beer decompose beer here it is so there's a built-in thing in r ah uh, so much for zooming in there you go so there's a ts time series object you feed in your raw data tell it what frequency it, it is uh you know four beer was four quarters a year and then you call decompose on this you tell it if it's additive or multiplicative and it does all of this stuff for you uh and now you can be happy because you've done all of this for free without putting any work into it okay uh, but that's the same idea right you get the global trend you get the seasonal trend and you get the random noise and you've gotten all of this for free you could do the same exact same thing with the uh, uh, airline passengers decompose except now it's multiplicative instead of additive uh, and you get a nice uh, plot of plots like this one that tells you what the components are so this is a very neat trick to get rid of uh, seasonal effects in time series that would otherwise confuse you, right? So you know, if you want to reason about, say, the effects of some intervention that happened, say, here, right? So we're going to talk about this in a minute. We're going to talk about you know comparing some sort of you know after values of the time series to some kind of before values of the time series. Uh, we're going to talk about that shortly but if you want to do that you could hopefully see how that would be subject to uh, lots of noise depending on where you're at on the seasonal trend right if you're unlucky and you hit you know summer on the left hand side and winter on the right hand side or something you get really different estimates of this effect okay uh, so it's always a good idea to try to clean up time series by removing seasonal effects before you do any kind of additional analysis okay, if you suspect there are seasonal effects does that make sense okay cool so that was a neat trick so now let's talk about following um this is a time series of the number of hospital admissions with acute coronary events uh aces for short in italy uh at some point around uh when they introduced the smoking ban in all indoor public places uh, 2005 is when that happened um, and this is the time series of hospital admissions for things that are presumably caused by smoking or exposure to smoking okay, before and after this intervention, which was the, this ban on smoking in public places. So now as a good policymaker and you know, societal computing students and whatnot, you will probably wonder you know, to what extent was this policy intervention effective? can we evaluate that can we estimate the effect of this policy on some outcome that we care about you know, presumably you would want to have fewer of these hospital admissions uh, for stuff that could be caused by smoking okay. so what do you see what does it look like what does the data look like Awesome. Like gradually going slightly up compared to the before. There's like uh, 
increase that we started in 2005 and then that was over again. Okay, yeah. Any, yep, I agree with this. Anything else? What do you see? I guess a, a different way um, phrasing that is like there's a continual trend upwards and we um, ban on some of these sort of drops that kind of has seemingly a sort of grasping at straws there. Look, I can, I can see that. In? Yeah, I would just say that it doesn't. It doesn't look like the smoking gun has any effect. The skeptic. Like that little drop just doesn't, it could be just a point. Good. Healthy dose of skepticism is what I always say. Yeah. Yeah. The doctor recommended. Yeah, it just seems like it's almost just like a color right there. But other than that, you take that out. Great. Okay. So I, I love that we're disagreeing on this. <laughs> Let's test this, right? You're a good data scientist by now, and you're expert regression modelers. You've spent you know, how many hours uh, in R uh, and whatnot talking about these? Let's test it. How do we test it? So here's the thing we could do. Um, we could look at the before period, right? The period before the intervention, so you know, up to 2005, and we could estimate a linear trend of all of those uh, observations before the intervention. That's this solid red line you see there. Okay. You could do the same thing. You could estimate a linear trend of all of the after observations, the ones starting in 2005, independently, all by themselves. Okay. So that would be this one here. Okay. You have to believe that I'm not lying about these linear trends. They are, you know, the ones estimated from these observations. Um, so, and here's the, you know, the cool uh, causal reasoning trick. Okay, you're arguing the opposite. You're saying, you know, if the ban didn't have any effect whatsoever, you should expect to see the prior trend continuing uninterrupted. That seems reasonable. If the bad, the smoking bad had no effect on the outcome, you should see no change in trend no, around the intervention time. So therefore, you know, the counterfactual, right? You would expect the number of these acute coronary events to continue along this uh, dashed line that is just an extension of the linear trend before the intervention. If instead the ban had some effect, right? You should observe that in you know, this drop in level around the intervention time or immediately following the intervention, as well as possible changes in the slope of this time series after the intervention compared to the slope of before the intervention. That's the causal. Uh, relationship reasoning here. Okay. So remember the three ingredients. Uh, we have temporal precedence. The cause came before the effect was observed by construction because it's a time series is you know the way we constructed it. We get that for free. Um, we show some correlation, you know, between you know we show that there's some statistical difference right between these two things. Right, so that's the correlation between cause and effect, the association, we measure it. And there's, what's the third one? We still have one. Plausible alternative explanations. Do we have that or don't we have that? Just based on this part. Well, what else could there be? What else? Could, what else might we miss? Give me one. If you if you think there's something missing, tell me what it is. Uh, but this figure, I mean, uh, let me think about it. If there's no smoking ban, this uh, figure can still not be linear. 
correct? So if you are modeling this uh, linear, that that's something. Okay, so this is a fair point. The point is for folks on Zoom, if it wasn't loud enough, the point is what if the relationship isn't linear? Your model is a poor approximation. Yes, that's always true. Um, most real world relationships won't be linear. Um, there are, I'm going to ignore that entirely. You know, I, I can model nonlinearities. I can include, you know, polynomials. Uh, I, I can regress over polynomials. So I, I can model that. Um, I, I'm ignoring all of that complexity for the sake of arguing the, the greater point about the relationship. Uh, I, there are, I think, other things that you could complain about that I'm waiting for Sam to mention them. <laughs> he always does. Uh, other than you know whether this is uh, well enough captured by a linear trend or not. I think I think you're right. I agree with you. But you know, let's say let's say that it's not too far from a linear trend. That that's not the real thing that I I'm getting at here. In based on that, I have like a few ideas. Please, like what if you know you just have more less forest fires happening in other forests? Like it, like it, like kind of depends on the air quality as well. On just like that general region. Um, because it's like there's so many different little things that can happen here to a general public's lungs. And just to me, like this chart only shows smoking there. And like I just need like a few like so uh, when we talk about the three ingredients for a causal relationship, right? And the third one that we're talking about right now, plausible alternative explanations. The plausible part is an important part of that term. You can't just say. Uh, like oh, there's other there's other alternative explanations, right? You haven't given me enough to exclude them, right? You can't just say that. You have to tell me what they are and argue that they're plausible. So I, th I think you did. You gave me a good example. You know, what if you know these things are caused by poor air quality? Uh, yeah, and what if a factory beside this place, um, Sicily, just closed down uh, in 2005 at the beginning, right? Like. You know, those are all things that could very well happen, especially in that region, which is like, those are the years where I remember like NATO signed like a bunch of things like saying like greenhouse gases are bad. Like this is, who is that guy's name? Uh, uh, Politician, Ed, Edgar. Oh, I don't know. I was gonna say oh, just Lord, generally yeah. other, other policy interventions going on at this time which is what he's saying. that's the point that's the key other policy interventions or whatever other interventions at the same time that's the key okay? but you, you can't in general you can't just say that like oh there were other policy interventions what if there were, what if there are other policy interventions at the same time you can't just say that you have to tell me one concrete one okay. that i haven't considered okay. and you did you did you did tell me one you said you know whatever the factory that was polluting or the whatever forest fires you you, you did good i'm not i'm not uh, uh, no, yeah, criticizing, yeah, yeah. but as a general argument, right? When you make this argument, right. you can't just say there are other things. You have to tell me what they are, and you have to argue that they're plausible, right? And and you argue that I haven't accounted for them. Right? You demonstrate that they exist and they're plausible, and then it's on me to account for them. Otherwise, you just say, you know, what if there are other things? You know, it, it's on you to you know to argue that they're plausible, right? And identify them and argue that they're plausible. It's on me to account for them. It's on you to argue that I should do that. But okay, so that's the key, right? That's the only thing missing. I'm going to argue. The only thing missing is, uh, you know, we just don't know if there were other things that happened at exactly the same time that could also explain this effect, right? Maybe they closed down the, you know, whatever, the uh, steel mill next door or something, right? And that was a huge pollutant. Uh, and all of a sudden the air got cleaner and that, you know, that also contributed to the effect we're observing. Right? So that's, that's a weakness, a limitation of this. But otherwise you could see you know, how it's really powerful. Right? That thing aside is really powerful right? because it gives you almost all you need. It's a strong, uh, it's a powerful design. So how do we model this? Let's regress. 
How do we regress? How do we test this? How do we test that? You know, how do we model these trends or the change, this drop, this drop in level here, the, the trends, how do we model this? Specify a linear regression model for me. Anybody on Zoom? How, uh, what's a linear regression model? How do I write it? What, what model would I estimate to model these trends and whatever drop in level to test if they are statistically significant? Oh, didn't you already do it? Like you said, you take the left side of the points and the right side of the points and you the models on those two halves. That partition of the data. And then you like. Okay, how do I do this jointly in the same model? The indicator variable for like pre and post smoking man is that a different segment? Yeah, we're going, we're getting somewhere. So we need a few things, right? We need some variables. We need some variables to capture time, but we need to know where we are on the x-axis, right? Um, so you have a you have a real variable for time, and then you have a Boolean variable for of your past two thousand. So right, so right now. Right, the raw data, I have an X and a Y. The X is the raw, whatever month this is in. Uh, and the Y is this, this raw count of whatever this is, ACEs, right? I have these two things. I'm gonna argue that's not quite enough. I, I need more stuff. I need to, to add a few more things to this to be able to model all of this stuff that I wanna capture, right? So I heard a few, I heard, you know, you need to know where you are relative to the invention. Right. Uh, so you need some indicator variable. We call this a dummy variable uh, that just you know takes one of two possible values, zero or one or, or false or true. Um, and you know it's, it's zero in the first half or whatever before the intervention and becomes one after the intervention. A way to know where we are relative to the intervention. Like we have some measure of time, which is the x-axis. Okay. Do I need anything else? What would that look like? We need the transform time and the reference to zero, I guess. Because, well, I don't know if it's in like years or UTC or. I, yes, I could do that. I could change the time. That makes sense. I, I will do that. I could change the time to be zero index, then, you know, be like one increments or something like that. Um, uh, so, I, yeah, I could have a time counter for you know observations rather than the raw whatever this is months and years but so so far i have some time counter and i have a dummy indicator variable for where i am relative to the intervention is that enough what's the what's the model how do i write it Um, uh, or not. Yeah. Well, so let me. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna write here to see. So we can all see. And oh, there are no notes. Never mind. Uh, view. Where's the notes? Uh, show prisoner notes. Okay. And now I can write. So Y is what? So let's let's say I have I have a counter for time. So this thing is zero, one, two, three, four, whatever. Okay. I have a dummy. I can't see that far. I'm old and 
a poor eyesight. I have an intervention, hold on, give me a second. That's zero, 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 and then at some point it becomes one, 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 and stays that. Okay. Uh, okay, and now Sam, tell me. So we have, so we know the indicator V and then we call the intercepts X0 and X1 and we call the set 0 plus M1 X plus V times X1 plus M4. Okay, so let me, uh, you're saying there's some intercept, I, 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 you know, as part of the formula I specify in R, I don't write that explicitly, but I could, you know, one plus, there's some intercept, there's something, uh, you know, coefficient, right? There's this coefficient for time, there's coefficient for, well, I should do, uh, Okay, so I have these two guys. What else? We have one more for time. Aha, aha, there goes the trick. Do you see it? That's a cool trick. And your test is whether beta one and or beta two are different from zero. Right, and also beta zero, I guess, if I care about the, the Oh. So I, I test all of these coefficients basically, right? Um, we can, what do they mean? Let's talk about that. What do the coefficients mean in this formulation? What's beta zero, what's beta one, and what's beta two? How do, how do I interpret them? What's beta zero? Wait, you like that? Zero with the intervention is the slope pre intervention. Yep. Yeah. Beta zero is the slope of this line pre intervention. Does that make sense? Beta one is the length of the vertical. Beta one is the length of this vertical line here. Yep. Cool. What's beta two? It's... Is it the slope or the difference in slope? Yes, to which of the two? Difference in slope. Difference in slope. You can also say the difference in time is called six between no intervention and an intervention between no and an intervention and an intervention and time is called six time is called six i mean i guess that doesn't really that's not really comprehensible for this model but yeah so uh, the intervention variable is always zero before the intervention, right? Mm -hmm. So as long as we're before the intervention, this whole term goes away and it's only beta zero contributing to that trend. And then all of a sudden, this thing starts ticking. So therefore beta two starts to have an impact, right? So now the time trend you know, has this beta two coefficient and has the original beta zero coefficient. So it's the difference in trend. And if you want to bring together the terms that multiply by time, you make it more clear which one is which part of the terms. Yep. That makes sense. Um, I leave that to the reader as an exercise because I am too lazy to type, but I agree. 
Okay, do you see this? This is a really powerful trick. And we use this interaction term in the regression to model this with just two variables. The example I have in the slides here talks about how uh, da, da, da. Yeah, so the example I had worked out on the slides did this with three variables instead of two. So here I have two counters, right? I have the I have the time counter that we talked about, right? Just ticks. I have the intervention dummy, which is this last one, that's zero for the first half and becomes one afterwards. And I have a separate counter for time uh, that sleeps until the intervention and starts ticking afterwards. Um, so I could do it this way, but it's exactly the same outcome. Uh, and as it turns out, these coefficient estimates uh, are exactly what we just talked about, right? The slopes, the slope before, the change in slope, and the change in level. Okay, and then we do hypothesis testing on the coefficients, like we did with regression before. You know, are they statistically significantly different from zero? You know, if yes, then we trust that that's a meaningful correlation, and that's the test. That's the trick. Okay, that makes sense. So what am I, am I missing anything except for uh, other things that may have happened at the same time that could explain the effect? Is there anything else I'm not telling you? Or I should tell you? What about what about other plausible alternative explanations I can measure? You know, what if I have an air quality index or something? I have measurements of those. Could I do something with that? Can you add more terms and another intervention in the middle? Of course you can, it's just a regression model. You can add anything. <laughs> Remember the billion dollar idea from, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, how this is such a powerful you know, modeling framework because it allows you to model alternative explanations that you can measure and to account for those, control for those. Right, so that's the trick, right? I can model you know, air quality and anything else by observations of all kinds of other things that I have access to, I can model those explicitly, right? And therefore adjust my estimates of the effect based on those. That makes sense? So that's cool. That's really cool, right? I think that's super cool that you could do that. But what about the, we started with some assumption about independence and whatnot, and we talked a lot about that. I made a big deal of it. Do we have that? Well, so these observations of whatever outcome variable are not independent observations anymore. They are not because you know they're they say because of regression to the mean, it's very uh likely that they won't deviate too much from one uh, uh, point to the next consecutive time point. Uh, so the there will be some, probably some pattern, so some correlation between consecutive values of all of these measures, which violates this fundamental assumption of independence of observations. So we're, I mean, we kind of we look how much we've done. We've sort of done we've done causality almost, except for you know the uh, steel mill. Except for a steel mill, we've done almost causality, right? Isn't that cool? It, 
except now I'm telling you that you have to throw it all away because you're violating, you know, non-independence. That seems unsatisfying. Right, so time series have this fundamental problem that, you know, they're violates uh, this independence requirement by construction. So, so what do we do? We're so close, we can't just throw it all away. Look how much, like we took us weeks to get here. We can't just throw it away. <laughs> Plus, I mean, it's, look how it's simple, it's beautiful, it's so nice. We can't throw it away, we gotta save it. How do we save it? That. <clears throat> We can count the trend effect like we did at the beginning of class. Except the trend is what we're modeling. So yeah. kind of taking out the trend itself is counterproductive. Or, uh, or is it? Or is it? How, how might we do this? I think you're onto something. Yeah. So th there's two, and we're almost on time. So I'll just tell you. Uh, instead of letting you, I don't know, boil until Thursday over this, there's two things. One is the good news is you could actually, uh, so a you can estimate this correlation uh, between. It's called auto correlation. It's correlated with itself. You can estimate this correlation between, you know, these these observations at time t and observations at t minus one, t minus two, whatever. You can estimate this. We can compute it. Um, and you know one way there's ways to remove it uh, for example by taking the difference between consecutive observations and modeling that instead of modeling the raw observations there's things we could do it's not all hopeless but i'm not going to talk about them because we're out of time uh, but i have amazing readings for you to read about on your own uh, so it's not, we don't just throw it away. It's really cool. We don't throw it away, right? It's, it's salvageable. That's one thing. That's your know, principled ways to deal with it. The second good news, even better good news, is actually, as it turns out, Bobo, this is amazing. You ready? Okay. <laughs> I was really worried about this. So like, oh man, we can't just throw this away. Like it's been so cool. We can't just throw it away. Plus like, it seems like, you know, doing this autocorrelation stuff is so much work. Like, you know, ain't nobody got time for all of this. Right, so how do we still save it? Turns out, ready? It's beautiful. Turns out all of the covariates that you model, you know, things like air quality index and all those other things that also vary with time, those take out this correlation, the auto correlation on the outcome. So you're fine. You're basically fine without doing anything. Most of the time. Wait, wait, wait. You can't just drop that off. <laughs> we're, we're, we're past the... all of the correlation between the variables. I'm saying the one independent. Let me repeat. I'm saying that when, in addition to just modeling time versus the outcome, you also model these time varying covariates like the air, air quality index uh, measured over time or other kinds of things that you expect are plausible alternative explanations. When you do those, when you include those in the model, it, it resolves magically this uh, non-independence problem that you had in the first place for reasons that I cannot explain because I do not understand it. You can't just say it. Well, but that's why, that's why you have assigned reading. So you can come back and like some teach me. Out of the property of the correlation? I have yet to, they don't pay me enough to figure that out. So <laughs> I have yet to get that far, but it's really exciting. Can you believe this? Yeah, I don't know that. I was very, very excited when I read this. I was like, well, okay, great. So we talked to anything. It just works. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't go back and say like, this is not how to figure this out. Oh, I, it's, I'm going to lose sleep over this. I love it. It's like a really great puzzle now. I'm, See, I'm very sure. I'm going to, I'm going to try to figure this out, but um, I don't know how far I'll get by Thursday, but I'll, I'll do my best. Yeah. In any case, there are, uh, 
there are principled ways to deal with this that are more complicated. So we don't throw it away. The point is that we can actually use this. It's really powerful. It's so close to causal. You know, it's so simple and beautiful. It's so close to causal. It's it's really great. Okay, we're gonna do another one on Thursday. Yeah. Yep. Um, I sorry. I was gonna say that you could like this is something I've done before, but you could use this thing called the Arima um, in R, and yep. you just dump everything in. It just gives you the coefficients. You just match that coefficient to Plot. Yeah. So, but Arima with interventions is actually a little bit more complicated. Oh. Uh, but yeah, that's really that's also on the reading. So I have I have two papers that I would really want you to read. They are beautifully written, very simple, very to the point. They explain all of these tricks that you could do to make all of these things work, uh, and they're really great. And I'll send them uh, shortly. It's just two papers, kind of methodological foundational papers that describe the method, not examples used. Well, they have examples in there, but they explain how to how to do this better than I was able to do today. Uh, that's it. Have fun. See you on Thursday. <laughs>